One of the biggest problems for a filmmaker is finding good material. And therefore, when suddenly out of the blue, I received Tunes of Glory sent to me by producer Colin Leslie, I thought, my goodness, this one I've got to make. Because it's full, it has one strong situation that is so strong that it carries you right through the film. This terrible fight between these two colonels and surrounding them, a bunch of other in-depth characters, a joy for a director. I immediately got Colin Leslie to put me in touch with James Kenway, who wrote the book and the first draft screenplay. James, if he had lived, and sadly he died very young in a motor accident, would be one of the top novelists of today. He was a fine writer, and he had been a young officer in the Argyles, the Scottish regiment, that our film is all about. Now, when it was decided that I would do it, I immediately thought, of course, of my old chum, Alec Guinness. You know, if there was a way of making a picture with Alec, I found it. I said, Alec, I think it's a very, very good part. I think you would be right for Barrow. Now, Barrow was the paperwork man, the man from Sandhurst, the educated one. And I didn't think of Alec for the other part. And he said, Ronnie, I've played that part too many times. But if you'll let me play Jock, the red-headed boozer, I'm your man. And I knew that if Alec said he could play a part, he could play it, no matter what it was. I mean, take a look at Fagin and characters like that. He was never Alec Guinness. He was always the character. And of course, I jumped at it. And we got together and we said jointly, who shall we get for the other colonel? And it may have been Alec who said, what about Johnny Mills? And I seem to remember saying, well, Johnny always plays lower deck stuff. He doesn't usually play upper crust people. And Alec said, well, he's an actor, isn't he? And I said, yes, Alec, you're right. And so we cast Johnny. Now, these two actors hadn't worked together since Great Expectations, which I produced. At the time of Great Expectations, John Mills was the well-known actor, and Alec was completely unknown. So there was no question about the billing on the film. Uh, it was John Mills and Alec Guinness. But now, Alec had become if anything, a little more important than Johnny, although Johnny probably wouldn't like me saying that. However, it didn't cause a problem because, bless them, they tossed up for who should have top billing and I suspect that Alec must have won. Now, they were very good friends, but they were also, each of them, very much out to give the best performance. Performance perhaps is wrong because they both became the characters they were playing. But I had the sort of little bit of competition between the two, which really paid dividends. Alec is a very, very difficult person to know. I very much doubt if his wife even really knew him all that well. I think maybe it was slightly calculated. I think he liked being in the shadows. I think he liked not being noticed. Um, I think when he would come into a room, he would not come in as Alec Guinness, the actor. He would slide in. But the moment he had a part to play, he became that character. Now, with Tunes of Glory, Alec became the boozy, red-headed old colonel. Uh, it was almost impossible to know that it was, in fact, Alec Guinness. I think, perhaps, Johnny Mills 
when he went home in the evening, became Johnny Mills. He was a, a good, good husband, a great father to uh, Haley and to Juliet. And I think he became Johnny. But Alec, when he went home, still remained that character. I remember one day he was very disgruntled on the set and I said, what's the matter, Alec? He said, there's nothing the matter. I'm just being what I've got to be today. If you take the two parts of the two kernels without any doubt whatsoever, the most difficult part to play was Barrow, was the part that John played. Because if that had been played by a dull actor, by anybody less talented and brilliant than Johnny. It could have been the secondary part, but Johnny played it with such subtlety, with such depth, that you had to say, oh my goodness, which is the best of these two? Because they're both so wonderful. I don't believe in telling an actor too much if they understand what the part is about. And when we have a general conversation about it, then if they're good, I leave well alone. And occasionally I will drop in my suggestion. And I seem to remember that with Johnny Mills, I suggested that maybe he could model his character slightly on Montgomery, who was a British general, he could. So a little group of us, including James Kenway, um, went to see the Colonel of the Argyles. And he welcomed us warmly and said, yes, he'd be delighted for his regiment to participate in the film because they weren't very busy. He said, leave your script and come back and see me in, in a couple of days and I'll have read it and then we'll know where to go from there. Well, in a couple of days we went back and we were ushered into the Colonel's office, which was empty. The Colonel was not there. But to our horror, we saw on the desk a paperback edition of the book. And obviously in order to sell copies, the publisher had put a picture on the front of the Colonel Jock and on his lap was this tarty looking actress, which by the way in the film was played by Kay Walsh. And uh, we thought, oh, oh, this is trouble. And indeed it was trouble. When the Colonel came in, he said, I am sorry, gentlemen, I wouldn't dream of allowing my regiment to participate in a film that uh, shows this kind of thing. And I'm sorry and bye bye. And of course we were shattered. And we said, well, please, could we just use the castle? Because there's such a wonderful shot coming up the street. He said, you can use the castle, but you'll have to put a different roof on because I don't want it recognized. And so we did what is known as a match shot. And in the foreground in front of the camera, we put a false roof to disguise the castle. All the interiors in the film were shot at Shepparton Studios. They were all studio sets, except for the exterior of the barracks, which was on the back lot. And uh, we really made it look cold. But now comes the problem. How do we get a Scottish regiment? I mean, it was essential. And then we found that in London, there was the Territorial Army, and there was, in fact, a Scottish regiment, weekend characters, really. But also, they had a splendid pipe band. So we contacted them, and we made them the Argyles. And they were wonderful, all of them. They're absolutely great. Now, the kilt has to be worn in, in a special way. And a true Scot knows how to walk in the kilt. 
he'll swing it backwards and forwards as he walks and it, it, it looks very attractive and very nice. Now, we had several Englishmen playing Scots and they were great at being Scottish, including the accent. But when it came to the kilt, they really had to be trained because they would sit down on chairs with their legs apart. And you know, r real Scots don't ever part their legs. They sit with them very modestly together like ladies because it is said that they don't wear underclothes with the kilt. It's never been proved, I don't think. It did cause us a certain amount of trouble, although in every other way, I had a, a wonderful cast. Dennis Price, for example, what a wonderful depth of character there was there. Percy Herbert, Duncan McRae. Oh, I could go on and on. Kay Walsh, who was once married to David Lean, was a lovely actress in her way as versatile as Alec. I think Kay admired Alec very much and emulated him, not by playing things that he would have played, but in being different, in not being herself. I think she enjoyed that. We didn't quite know who we should choose for the girl, for Jock's daughter. And uh, a, a friend of mine who was also an agent said, there's a girl in repertory up in the Midlands who I think would be ideal. Her name is Susanna York. She has never made a film. It's always been theater. She's very, very young late teens and uh, Alec bless his heart said well I'll do the test with her which is most unusual because usually actors don't like to do tests with would-be actors and this girl without any doubt was ideal casting now she joined us rather reluctantly she didn't think films were all that important but, of course, once she joined us and once we started filming, she got caught up in it just like all of us. Wouldn't behave like an important actress, which she was because she was playing an important part. She'd sit on a piece of wood or something and I had a chair for her with her name on, Susanna York. I said, you know, Susanna, you should sit in your chair. She could never understand her own importance, which was endearing. One of the pluses with Tunes of Glory, and again, all praise to James Kennaway, is that the characters, the two main characters, and indeed the other characters as well, are not black and white characters. At one point in the picture, you just like Barrow for coming in and disrupting what was a happy community. And you felt, why are they chucking Jock out? But then Jock behaves so badly to Barrow that you dislike him and you understand and sympathize completely with Barrow. Well, I think that's wonderful. I think that's what makes good characters. In the end, I think you come out sort of liking both of them. Because although Barrow behaved like a, you know, a martinet, if that's the right word, and Jock behaved disgracefully, you somehow knew by the end of the film why, and you understood why. The Dennis Price character is an enigma. Is he after Jock's job, after Barrow's job? Is he smooth and apparently cooperative while at the same time waiting for his opportunity? Or is he genuinely that sort of a person and there is no ulterior motive behind it? 
And I don't know. I really don't. I never asked Dennis. And I don't know even whether Dennis knew. James Kennaway and I had talked a lot about the regiment. I picked his brains about the way they behaved, the way they operated and why. And uh, I think James, who was a writer, but nevertheless was part of the regiment, I think he was highly critical of them. He shows that in the book and indeed in the screenplay. James was the only writer that I have had on the set all the way through the film. I guess I don't know as much about the Scottish tradition, particularly when it comes to the army, that perhaps I should have known. That was why I had James with me all the time, because he knew all the traditions. And we liked each other, quite apart from our relationship as writer-director. Alec also got on with him very well. So the three of us would go into my trailer before we shot a sequence, and we would discuss it together. And if there was any changes that were necessary, James would make them right there and then, and we would have that scene rewritten. It's after Barrow shoots himself that Jock begins to become unhinged, and he behaves strangely. And I wanted to add to the strange behavior in some way. And so I started this hum which gradually got louder and louder as the scene went on and then cut out sharply. It made the scene more strange. It made Alex seem more deranged. Music is very, very important in this big last sequence because Jock starts talking about this magnificent funeral that they will give to Barrow, who, quite frankly, whose death Jock is responsible for. And whilst he's making his speech to all his men about how the funeral will be conducted, he mentions the tunes of glory. He says, we'll have this one, and then we'll have that, and then we'll have this, and as he makes his speech, we slip in the actual music itself of the pipes, coupled with an orchestra as a backing. Well, this was very difficult to do. Our composer, Malcolm Arnold, and I spent a lot of time at my home. We had tapes and we sort of put it together musically. And we then explained this to Alec. So he almost played the scene as though he was hearing the music. And it brought another dimension. We'll have all the tunes of glory. But remember the more clearly. Sure we will. I feel very strongly, particularly with the kind of film I used to make, that the actors are the important thing. I want to put up on that screen the very best that the actor can give to me. And I don't want to be clever. I want to make them clever. I was brought up in a school that said there is no camera. We zoomed. We panned, we tracked, but we always covered camera movements so that we remained unobtrusive. <laughs> we would spend hours making a smooth track, you know, any, any little bump on the track we just wouldn't tolerate. We never cut away from a camera that was panning. We always waited for it to stop panning before we cut. Because if you cut away whilst you're panning, this is getting very technical, but when you cut away when you're panning, 
it jolts you. you. Instead of there is no camera, it became I am a camera. Now immediately you do that, it doesn't matter if you play tricks with the camera because you say I am a camera. It's just a different technique. And in some ways, it's, it's better, I am a camera, because then it doesn't matter. You can do all kinds of different shots. But the kind of films I like to make are where the actors are the ones that star. I don't think that a director should star in his own film. And when somebody like Alec or Johnny or Maggie Smith who won an Oscar from one of my films, I sort of feel, well, I had a little bit to do with that. Tunes of Glory is the film that I am most proud of having made. I can't absolutely say it was my favorite film because it was a very special film and it didn't make a lot of money and of course, one gets jobs based upon how much money one's previous film has made. But it holds up today. And one of the reasons it holds up is that it was true to itself. It's a, a sort of timeless, really. And, uh, you know, films have their fashion. At the moment, it's frenetic. Everything is cut, 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 you know to the point where you say, wait a minute, wait, wait, could you could hold that just a fraction longer so that I can see what it is? But no, it gets more and more and more frenetic. Now, I think that that is something of today, but I think that it will swing back a little the other way. I think there will come a time when people will say, oh, for goodness sake, do I have to see cut, 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 cut all the time? Couldn't I just watch a film and be told a good story with good acting and not have all the messing around?